Next incendiary here, guys. Hope y'all are having a fantastic freaking day. In today's video, we're going to be going over the backstory, lore, and perks of the new Killer of the Night and the new Survivor Vittorio from the new DBD PTB. This was all filmed live on my Twitch channel over at twitch.tv slash nextincendiary, which I do stream on every single day of the week. So if you're enjoying this content, I'd love to see you in the chat. Maybe stop by, say hi, and drop that follow. It would mean oh so much to me, my friends. It truly would. Um, but besides that, let's get into the video, and I hope you guys enjoy what is the night and Vittorio. Vittorio Toscano, born to Alberto and Caterina Toscano in 1343. Vittorio Toscano was the youngest of three and third in line to inherit his family's land. At age 15, his father sent him to train with Ettore Fabrizio, the same knight who trained his older brothers in the military arts. But Vittorio didn't take to combat training the way his brothers did. As a student of philosophy, he believed physical violence to be the last refuge of the incompetent. Infuriated by Vittorio's pacifism, Fabri sorry, Fabrizio ordered one of his pages to attack him. Vittorio dodged and blocked the, uh, sorry, the blows, but refused to fight back. When his enraged opponent lunged, Vittorio parried. His attack, sorry, attacker tripped, falling on his own dagger. He bled out in less than a minute, and Vittorio threw down his sword, swearing to never pick it up again. Since Vittorio demonstrated an aptitude for scholarship, his frustrated father sent him to study with his uncle Renzo. Beside being the Duke of Portoschiaro, excuse me while I butcher that name, Renzo was also a scholar and a collector of rare artifacts. Under Renzo's tutelage, Vittorio focused his studies on lost civil sorry, civilizations and ancient history. He researched forgotten tombs and became an expert on the philosophy and wisd sorry, wisdom of ancient secret societies and obscure guardians of knowledge. Guardians present in almost every century in culture. Guardians that went by manifold names, uh, depending on the time and region, and were said to be from another dimension, a perfect world. He collected anything on watchers, keepers, guides, masters, observers. Vittorio's research revealed these guardians acted as a gatekeeper of advanced and arcane knowledge that would gradually help humanity transcend to a higher plane of existence. He theorized the observers waited for humanity to acquire wisdom before releasing knowledge that otherwise would lead to their self-destruction. Slowly, these observers found ways to inspire humanity with knowledge that would stimulate growth, understanding, and collective wisdom. Vittorio adopted his uncle Renzo's view that greed for money and power was the source of all conflict. His hope was that the lost knowledge of these gatekeepers might bring peace, harmony, and order to a violent world. At Vittorio's urging, Renzo mounted an expedition to find lost relics and artifacts from the ruins of antiquity. In Hungary, they discovered a bronze dodecahedron that dated back to Roman times. In Asian Minor, they uncovered a hidden tunnel beneath the obelisk of Theodosius, where they discovered stone tablets engraved in Akkadian cuneiform. They told the tales of mysterious artifact, sorry, artifacts split into three and scattered across the world. A clue led them to the ruins of Troy, where a secret chamber revealed a treasure trove anti sorry, of antiquities. The most precious was a piece of that mysterious artifact. Another clue that led them to the Isle of Rhodes, where a hidden cave, a second part of the same relic. In Delphi, under the Temple of Apollo, Vittorio discovered the third piece on a black marble altar. Engravings on the altar showed a map of Crete and a star over the Palace of Minos. Deep in the labyrinth below, sorry, below the ruins of the palace, Vittorio discovered a place to put the key created by the three relics, and ancient machinery came to life. A stone wall slid open, revealing a hidden vault. Renzo and Vittorio entered and found a white marble wall inscribed with what seemed to be a form of Sanskrit. The message warned of a cult that sought to corrupt humanity with knowledge it wasn't ready for. They had hunted down the observers and imprisoned them, but before being imprisoned, the observers had hidden artifacts around the world, with secret knowledge about this dark force and how to stop it from destroying the world. The message on the wall also spoke of a stone from an ancient school that held the secrets of traveling between planes of existence. Vittorio, believing the stone had the, sorry, held the key to finding the observers or the perfect world, called the stone Lapis Paradisus. As they exited the vault, Renzo stepped on a black serpent. The serpent sank its fangs into Renzo's leg and disappeared as quickly as it appeared. The venom spread fast, and within minutes, he passed away. As Renzo's only heir, Vittorio inherited his estate, his library, his title, and his vast fortune. Determined to honor his uncle and help humanity transcend its weakness, greed, and cruelty, he knew he had to find the Lapis Paradis and free the observers if they were still alive. In 1391, Vittorio mounted an expedition. He employed a mercenary knight to aid in the effort and offer protection. Formerly a member of the Guardia Campania, Taros Kovacs feared no man or beast. Vittorio's exploration and discoveries eventually led them to the heavily guarded catacombs beneath the Portuguese city of Sintra. 
If the expedition wanted to enter, they would have to kill those who guarded it. Vittorio had no wish to shed blood and told Taros to find another way. Taros defied Vittorio and by the end of the day had him in an iron stamp. When they returned to Italy, Taros locked Vittorio in a dungeon and began a campaign of torture in Porto Scuro, promising to stop when he revealed the meaning behind the stone. Within weeks, the Taros grew tired of torturing the townsfolk, and Vittorio was left to rot in the dungeon with no one to talk to but the rats. In his solitude, he scratched the symbols from the Lapis Paradisus, sorry, Paradisus into the stone floor. He attempted countless uh, sequences while imagining a world like Paradise. And just when he was about to surrender to hunger and despair, he tried one last sequence while meditating on a world of endless peace and compassion. At first, he thought he had failed. He gasped the last of his strength as the rats approached menacingly, preparing to feast on his defeated sal sorry, sallow flesh. Then suddenly, a cold and natural black fog arose from the stone floor, and within moments, he heard cries of anguish and crows circling above him. With difficulty, he clambered to his feet and found himself in another world. Not the paradise he had expected. Potential energy. Your arcane abilities have adapted to the Entity's realm after centuries of wandering, granting you unprecedented control over its many devices. After working on a generator for 8 uninterrupted seconds, press the Active Ability button to activate this perk. When this perk is active, repairing the generator will charge this perk instead of making the generator progress. For each 1.5% of generator repair, the perk will gain 1 token up to 20 tokens? While this perk has at least one token and you're working on a generator, you can press the active ability button to consume all the tokens and instantly make the generator progress by 1% for each token. This perk then deactivates. If you lose a health state while this perk has at least one token, the perk will lose all tokens and deactivate. Missing a skill check will also result in some charges lost. A uh, second perk is Fogwise. In your countless years in the fog, you've seen it all, and when you're focused, you can remember most of it too. Hitting a great skill check while repairing a generator reveals the killer's aura to you for 6 seconds. Continuing on to his third perk, Quick Gambit. When you have a killer's attention, you know how to keep it. Others can be confident they won't be interrupted anytime soon. When you're chased within 24 meters of any generator, any other survivor working on that generator receives an 8% speed boost to the repair action. Taros Kovacs didn't remember much about his childhood, but what he did remember, he would chase his entire life. He remembered the cries and screams in the village. He remembered his mother forcing him to swallow a thick black fluid like medicine. He remembered collapsing to the hard floor only to waken in a mass grave buried under a crush of bodies with the sound of the village burning in his ears. He remembered pushing, pulling, and climbing to the top of the uh, bloody mass only to be seized by the death, destruction, and silence. The indifferent and impenetrable silence. A high-pitched whine suddenly sounded in his ears and his skin began to prickle as he realized he was in the presence of something he couldn't possibly understand. And though he couldn't articulate what he was experiencing, he knew it wasn't pain, grief, or fear. It was something else, something closer to awe. As Taros tried to make sense of the moment, he didn't notice the men who approached him from behind. He didn't even react when they carried him off to a small horse-drawn buggy and locked him up in a small wooden cage with other slaves. He just star sorry, he just stared at the scene, mesmerized. And even as they rode away, telling him sorry, telling him he was headed for Italy. Taro stared through the wooden cracks with eyes wide open and a heart wanting to understand what could not be understood. From that day on, Taros belonged to the Guardia Campania, where he trained under Kadir Hakam. There he learned to wield weapons, forge armor, and recite a, sorry, chivalry to obediently serve those who would employ his services. As the year passed, Taros made few friends among the hostile and competitive mercenaries, but his skills, strength, and smarts attracted a small following who believed his courage brought them luck in battle, and that one day he would help them earn their collective freedom. Three of his followers pledged their undying allegiance to Taros, sorry, to Taros and came to be known as his faithful three, his pack. Alejandro Santiago apprenticed with the Guardia Campania's armor. Durko's Malachek showed an aptitude for stealth and silent kills. Sander Ralt matched Taros in size and strength. His, uh, sorry, his weapon of choice, a massive battle axe. As the Guardia Campania carried out campaigns in faraway lands, Taros dispatched countless enemies. Years passed, blood flowed, and yet all that killing still didn't bring Taros closer to what he had experienced in his village. Nevertheless, for his bravery in his battle, um, Taros was granted knighthood and freedom. The Hungarian slave was now liberated, his brutality rewarded, though his heart still longed for something else. Something he could not name or describe. Tired of taking orders from those he considered his inferiors, Taros left the Guardia Campania to strike out on his own. Their leader, however, refused to release his followers. Determined to raise enough gold to liberate his followers, Taros found employment with a wealthy Italian lord. Vittorio Toscano was the Duke of Port 
Portoscuro. He was also a scholar, a world traveler, and a collector of ancient knowledge that had been hidden by an unknown cable of mystics. Taros joined Vittorio's latest expedition to find a fragment of a pillar from an ancient school lost to time. A stone Vittorio called the Lapis Paradisus, for he believed it held secrets to open a gateway into a perfect world beyond good and evil. The expedition searched Roman ruins in France and across the Pyrenees Mountains into Spain, where the path led to the catacombs beneath the Portuguese city of Sintra. The citizens there considered the catacombs sacred. Taros would have to kill the villagers guarding the entrance to retrieve the stone. Not wanting to shed blood, Vittorio commanded Taros to find another way, but Taros, who had seen the most horrific acts committed under the guise of chivalry, refused to be dissuaded by pretenses of honor. He waited for Vittorio to ride back to camp, then with a mighty roar, he pushed forward, cutting a path of blood and gore into the darkness until he had had the stone in his grasp. Upon returning to the, sorry, upon returning to the town of Portoscuro, Taros imprisoned Vittorio in his own dungeon, demanding to know the meaning behind the symbols etched in the stone. When Vittorio refused to talk, Taros brutally tortured his friends and relatives and made horrific displays of their bodies in the streets. But nothing he did shook Vittorio's resolve to keep the secrets of the stone from Taros. Enraged, Taros seized control of Vittorio's riches and raised a small army. Within months, Taros fearlessly marched upon the Guardia Campania, decimating their barracks, freeing his followers, cutting down his enemies like twigs, and collecting their righteous heads for his growing display of valor. In time, several lords in neighboring provinces believed Taros was the very embodiment of evil. They, brand sorry, they banded together to create a moral and virtuous army to purge evil from Portoscuro. Taros ignored their threats. He viewed the lords as cowardly lot who cloaked their greed and ambition in laws, codes, and platitudes. Laws and codes and platitudes designed to hide from the very darkness Taros embraced and accepted without judgment. But with his enemies on the march, Taros headed towards the dungeons to give Vittorio the death he deserved. He refused to afford him even the slightest hope of rescue. With dark intentions, he entered the small prison, wound his way into the bowels of the earth, and pushed through a torch-lit corridor. He hesitated for a moment, realizing he would never learn Vittorio's knowledge and secrets, but neither would anyone else. That was good enough for him. And so he unlocked and kicked open the dungeon door. Two quick strides brought him to an empty, rat-infested chamber. Taros stood silent for a moment. Then a roar of in sorry, indignation burst out of his lungs as the sound of battle suddenly reverberated through the town. Instantly, he stumbled through the corridor, rushed up the twisting stairs, vaulted out of the moonlit doorway, and charged through pools of gleaming blood and viscera smashing and shattering his way through the enemy. The moral and virtuous lords rained flaming boulders and tree trunks among the town, bursting through homes, crushing villagers like worms, pounding the ground and igniting stacks of hay and piles of lumber into massive tongues of fire. Amidst the carnage and chaos, the pack found Taros, and back to back they became a whirlwind of death. Some believed their courage gave them luck. Others believed something otherworldly protected them. Whatever it was, that alone felled dozens of warriors as easily as stomping and crushing beetles. And they, sorry, and as they butchered the enemy, Taros didn't notice the strange fog rising from the fallen corpses and clattering armor until he couldn't see two inches in front of him in any direction. Taros stumbled forward, groping, sorry, groping in the thick fog like the dark fluids his mother forced down his throat all those years ago. His coordination and sense of direction was confused as he called out for his pack. How long he stumbled in the almost perfect darkness he did not know. But suddenly the fog dissipated to reveal a phantasmal wasteland of rotting bodies and burning villages and great crumbling towers leaning drunkenly on the horizon. He stared in awe. A familiar high-pitched whine sounded in his ears and his skin began to prickle. He stood transfixed, realizing by some incredible chance his heart had found exactly what he had been searching for his whole life. He didn't need Vittorio. He didn't need the stone. He found his paradise. He had found the beauty and the honor. He had found the sublime. Nowhere to hide. The machinations of the weak and craven draw your ire. Your anger forces survivors to reveal themselves. Whenever you damage a generator, reveal the aura of all survivors standing within 24 meters of your position for 5 seconds. Uh, second perk. Hex, face the darkness. You make an example of one of your victims, forcing their allies to become awed by your power. Injuring a survivor by any means lights a dull totem, activating this perk, and hexes that survivor. While the hex is active, all other survivors outside your terror radius will scream intermittently, revealing their auras for 2 seconds each time. Other survivors can also see the aura of the cursed survivor for 8 seconds. When the survivor enters the dying state or becomes healthy, the hex totem becomes dull again and this perk deactivates. The perk is permanently disabled once this hex totem is cleansed. Hubris! Sorry, whenever you're stunned by a survivor, that survivor suffers from the exposed status effect for 20 seconds. Hubris has a cooldown of 20 seconds. Yeah. 
All right, guys. Let's bring it over to the middle of the nowhere. She got home, but apparently we got a new router, so it's a struggle to get online for a bit. Dude, that is super lame. Does the internet feel better, though? Enjoy? I feel like I'm not going to enjoy this. Yo, okay, what the fuck? This is actually not cool. What the fuck, man? What'd they do to my boy? My boy! I just want to say thank you guys so much for chilling through that whole video, by the way. I know it was quite a bit, but if you enjoyed this format, please let me know below in the comments. Or if you just want to see more of my content, I'd love to see you live, like I said in the beginning, guys. I hope you all have an amazing rest of your day and or night. I really hope this video was informative and you enjoyed it. See you next time, guys.